Thanks, Ralph. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for uh, putting on an unbelievably great uh, agenda with some really outstanding experts who bring a perspective of many years of experience and knowledge that you just don't hear, uh, partly due to who controls the media and who gets heard and who doesn't get heard, whether it's uh, Robert on CNN or not. But we all know they're filtered, so there aren't a lot of places where you can get this many high quality people who spend a lot of time thinking about the most fundamental issues facing the country. So, uh, Ralph, thank you for bringing us together again. Uh, better Markets is often referred to as a Wall Street watchdog, but we're also a regular regulator watchdog. Um, we're basically a counterweight to Wall Street. If you think Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, the biggest of the big, when they're in Washington trying to bend laws, policies, and rules their way, we're on the other side of the table fighting back to push them towards the public interest. That's what Better Markets does. And uh, I'll preempt a little bit here and say our website is www.bettermarkets.com. So, and there's a lot of information there. Today I want to talk a little bit about inequality. You can't talk about inequality today without talking about the 2008 financial crash. It was the worst financial crash since 1929. It caused the worst economy since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Better Markets did the first study on the actual cost of that crash, and it showed that it's going to cost just the United States more than $20 trillion with a tree, T, $20 trillion. Um, the study, uh, it's available on our website, details um, those costs from coast to coast. Others have done studies like that since then, including recently the San Francisco Fed, which actually confirmed that it's going to cost more than $20 trillion. However astronomically high numbers are, dollars don't tell the real story of the human cost, which were far-reaching and tragic. By October of 2009, just 13 months after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, just 10 years ago, but by, in just 13 months, the real unemployment rate in the United States was 17.2%. That meant there were 27 million Americans either out of work or forced to work part-time because they couldn't find full-time work. Because many of those people were heads of households, that unemployment tsunami actually hit more than 50 million Americans. Think about that. There were also more than 16 million foreclosure filings, and more than 40% of the homes in the United States were effectively underwater, meaning they were worth less than the amount of mortgages, mortgages they were paying. This and so much more is detailed in our report. So yes, there were lots of bad long-term trends regarding inequality before the crash, but they were all made worse, much worse, due to the crash. Unfortunately, many were also made worse by the policies undertaken in response to the crash. And we could talk about lots of them, some of them you heard about, like the taxpayer-funded TARP bailouts for Wall Street, although nothing for victimized homeowners. However, I want to focus on a key institution that gets referenced a lot, but is little understood, the Federal Reserve Board. So my title of my talk is, Fed's Policies Make Main Street Pay After Funding Wall Street Parties. There's an old saying that the job of the Federal Reserve Board is to take away the punch bowl once the party really starts going. The argument is that the Fed should not allow the economy to grow so much that it overheats and results in an inflationary spiral. To prevent that, it's supposed to increase interest rates and slow down the economy, supposedly for a soft landing to benefit everybody. However, those disarmingly benign, if not frivolous, metaphors obscure who the Fed's policies really help and who they hurt. These unmentioned distributional impacts are critical because the Fed's actions affect the wallets, wages, wealth, and economic well-being of every single American. And the consequences of those policies, including much greater inequality, much less opportunity, and tremendous economic anxiety, also have dramatic social and political implications. Just turn on your TV if you want to know what I'm talking about. The bottom line is that the Fed's policies since the 2008 financial crash have ladled out the punch in the bowl to the richest Americans and Wall Street's biggest banks. However, 
Now that the uh, painfully slow economic recovery from the crash is finally starting to reach Main Street, the Fed is changing policies, which is a costly punch in the gut to every hardworking American. That is illustrated in summary by the facts that the stock market, Wall Street bonuses, CEO compensation, and the wealth of the top 10% are at all-time highs. In fact, Wall Street, which caused the crash, which we also detailed in the Cost of the Crisis report, has profited every year since 2009. And salaries on Wall Street in 2017 rose to their highest levels since the 2008 financial crash. Think about this, though. The bottom 90% are still poorer today than they were in 2007 by between 17 and 34%. Think about that. So we have 52% of the nation's 50, 50 million public school students qualifying for free or reduced price lunches today. There are 44.2 million Americans today receiving food stamps. It was 28 million in 2008. And more than 40 million Americans today are being crushed by $1.5 trillion in student loan debt. The result is that 90% of Americans are still in a deep hole just trying to get back to where they were before the 2008 crash, while Wall Street and the top 10% break records for wealth, income, and bonuses. By changing policies and raising rates now, taking away the punch bowl, the Fed is making it much harder, if not impossible, for the 90% of Americans to dig out of that hole. But they didn't get any of the punch in the bowl, and they didn't get the party. That's where the distributional impact comes in that nobody wants to talk about. Raising interest rates not only makes it more expensive to borrow new money, but it also increases the cost for all the old money you borrowed before and haven't paid back yet. So what are the concrete results of Main, uh, on Main Street of the Fed's actions? Americans today, today are paying around $70 billion more than they were just two years ago in increased interest payments due to the Fed rate increases, $70 billion. Assuming the Fed continues to increase rates as it is projecting to do, Americans are going to pay a total of about $330 billion more from late 2016 to 2020. And then, after that, they're going to be paying close to $200 billion each and every year thereafter, assuming rates don't go up. That's $330 billion through 2020, $200 billion every subsequent year, moved out of the pockets of hardworking Americans into the pockets of banks, credit card companies, payday lenders, and other financial institutions. And this is the kicker. The sad fact of Fed rate increases is that those Americans will get no additional goods or services for that money. It is a pure transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street because the Fed's raising rates to slow the economy after 10 years of Wall Street partying. It's really noteworthy that enriching the already rich on Wall Street, corporate executive suites, and the rest of the 10% didn't cause the Fed to change policies for 10 years. It was only when the other 90% who haven't even got back to their le economic level of 2008, only when they started to do just ever so slightly better that the Fed decided to change policy and slow down the economy by raising rates. And that's why I say the Fed ladled out the punch in the bowl to the richest while giving the other 90% a punch in the gut. So what did the Fed do to give, the wall, give wall Street and the richest the punch bowl? Well, in response to the 2008 crash, the Fed took two dramatic policy actions. It dropped interest rates to an historic level of zero and launched an unprecedented policy of what they called quantitative, or QE, quantitative easing, or QE, whereby the Fed purchased trillions of dollars of bonds. Those policies dropped the cost of borrowing to zero and ignited a dramatic increase in asset prices. 
Now assets, particularly financial and real estate assets, are disproportionately owned by the already rich and are traded by Wall Street's biggest banks, which were not only bailed out in 2008, but were also among the favored few who were allowed to actually borrow money at zero or near zero. The result? The wealthiest 10% saw the value of their assets skyrocket due to the Fed's post-crash policies. For example, given that 84%, 84% of all stocks are owned by the wealthiest 10%, the 320% increase in the S&P index since 2009 made the rich much, much richer. Wall Street also gorged on Fed policies, which enabled them to pay themselves, get this, pay themselves $20 billion, $20 billion in bonuses in February of 2010. They have now returned to pre-crash bonus levels uh, and in 2017, paid themselves more than $31 billion. Now, February 2010, when Wall Street was paying themselves $20 billion, should ring a bell, because I just mentioned in February of 2010 was the very same month, the real unemployment rate on Main Street caused by the crash caused by Wall Street, the unemployment rate went to 17% throwing 27 million Americans out of work. The Fed's policies were of no help to those Americans who were losing their jobs, homes, health care, retirements, savings, and so much more. Simply put, Fed policies funded a Wall Street party for 10 years while the American dream was being crushed on Main Street. As one observer noted, the Fed policies were designed to enrich banks. It worked remarkably and tragically well. In contrast, it has taken almost 10 years for the incredibly slow and uneven recovery from the 2008 crash to finally start to reach the non-rich, evidenced by the lowest top-line unemployment rate of 3.7% since 1969. However, real after-inflation wages and productivity remain largely stagnant, meaning that more Americans are working and often working harder and longer, but they simply aren't getting ahead. In fact, the Fed itself did a study that showed almost 50% of all Americans couldn't come up with $400 for an emergency, for an emergency. On top of that, Americans have more debt now than ever before, $13.3 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars. It simply can't be denied that Main Street continues to live from paycheck to paycheck, getting by on modest wages without assets, borrowing to make ends meet, stretched to the limit, and worried about the future. Nevertheless, the Fed has interpreted this nascent and minimal uh, Main Street recovery the drop of the top line unemployment rate as a reason to reverse their post-crash policies. The, I love this, the Fed says, this, the euphemisms, if you don't love euphemisms, you can't deal with finance. The Fed says uh, that they're gonna normalize interest rates. Well, normalize is a fancy way of saying raising them on everybody else. Um, and at the same time, they're gonna unwind their QE bond purchases. Think about what that really means. The Fed is raising rates because the unemployment rate is going down, and it's worried that employers, God forbid, might at some point raise wages to workers that they need. That, the Fed fears, might cause prices to increase as those wage costs might be passed along in rising prices. I mean, they worry about a lot that hasn't happened. With inequality ballooning due to the post-crash policies, where the bottom 90% are still poorer than they were 10 years ago, these policy changes are going to make everything worse for the 90% of struggling Americans. That's because re uh, wage growth, both real and nominal, is sluggish by historic standards, and on one measure, real wages for typical workers have actually fallen recently. Moreover, and this is a kicker, moreover, conventional wisdom and the Fed's own views and projections over the last 10 years about employment, unemployment, wages, and growth have been consistently wrong, wrong, over and over again. 
And that's why some noted scholars have postulated that underemployment today seems to influence wage pressures more than the unemployment rate does. But the Fed's not paying attention to that. The Fed's changing policies. So let's look at how and how much that's gonna cost Americans. Since the Fed began raising rates, the average credit card rate has jumped from 15.1% at the end of 2016 to 16.9% today. The average home equity line of credit has jumped from 4.75% to a little over 6%, and adjustable rate mortgages are expected to reset up to 5.25% or more. Given financial institutions' cost of funds have been, let's remember, zero, not your cost, the big bank, zero, those rates, even before the increases, they were 15.1%. They were already incredibly high, extracting massive amounts out of Main Street pockets. And now that the Fed is raising rates, those very same institutions are raising the rates they charge. But note, they're, sip, they're super slow in raising the rate that they pay on your deposits. So they're taking more of your money coming and going. It's no wonder that non-real estate personal debt in the United States has hit a historic high of $4 trillion. So credit card balances are now at an all-time high with average balances of non-store credit cards of $6,348. Americans paid more than $100 billion in credit card interest and fees just last year. And as rates go up, payments are harder to make, which means more people are carrying larger balances, more people are missing payments more often, and more are paying not just higher rates, but higher fees. In the first quarter of 2018, consumers held about $2 trillion in interest rate sensitive debt and the Fed has raised rates uh, a quarter percent seven times for a total of 1.75%. Remarkably, that's exactly how much your credit cards have gone up. So if you assume all the interest rate sensitive debt reprices at roughly the same amount, that's an additional $35 billion more a year. Again, for no goods and services. So the couch you got with your credit card for $500 that's sitting in your living room that you're paying for, you're now paying a lot more for the couch. You don't have a more or better couch. It's the same couch. It's just more money coming out of your pocket, going into the pocket of the credit card companies. And the Fed's forecasted to raise their rates another 1% in the next year and a half a percent in 2020. That's another $60 billion out of your pockets. It's ultimately gonna, re it's gonna result in a total increase of $160 billion. The same thing for student loans. Those rates have also increased. From the, the start of the 2016-2017 academic year to the start of the 2017-2018 year, rates for undergraduate loans have increased from 3.76% to 4.26% a year. And for this academic year, they're expected to go up to over 5%. Given that students borrow loan, uh, generally borrow money for four years, that's an additional $5.4 billion. And rates are forecast to increase again. And, and at the, by the start of the 2021 academic year, it's gonna start costing students an additional $16.7 billion in extra interest for their degree, interest. Same thing on fixed rate mortgages. The Fed's interest rate increase hits the, the, the mortgage market pretty high too. Over the last two years, there's been about $3.5 trillion in one to four family fa sized family homes. There's gonna be a similar amount originated through the end of 2020. Those loans are gonna carry higher interest rates. The, Right, uh, I'm sorry, mortgage rates have increased from 3.45% in mid-August of 2016 to 4.53% in mid-August of 2018, and they're expected to go up again. But So since August of 2016, the cost to consumers, just of their rates going up on mortgages, $25 billion. When you add it up for all of 2016 to 2020, it's $152 billion. And with rates going up thereafter, Consumers who get new mortgages after August of 2016 will be paying an additional interest of more than $90 billion a year because the Fed's raising interest rates to take the punch bowl away from the people who didn't get the punch or the bowl. So that means on an average mortgage, the rate is gonna go up 
and they're going to be paying, the average family is going to pay almost $1,500 more a year just on their mortgage. And uh, with rates approaching levels not seen in eight years, closing in on about 5%, that rate's going to actually get close, uh, going to increase by about $2,000 a year. Same thing on corporate debt. You know, uh, when rates go to zero, if you're a corporation, you want to start borrowing like crazy. So the corporations borrowed like crazy. Historic debt is at all-time high, or corporate debt is at all-time highs. And sooner or later, somebody's going to pay for that. That's going to be consumers. So on top of paying the interest increase on personal debt, consumers are also going to be paying the interest rates on corporate debt. And adding insult to injury, with the, with the recent increases in federal spending and the $2 trillion tax cut, but mostly went to the rich, the government's annual deficits are going to a trillion dollars. Well, that's going on the debt. That has to be financed. Who's going to pay for that? Not the rich who got the tax cut. Main Street working families are going to get slammed twice. First, the rich get the tax cut, not them. Second, they get to pay the taxes to pay the higher cost of the deficit to pay for the taxes for the rich. So let me conclude. The combined cost of revolving debt and new mortgage originations to American consumers are already $70 billion a year. Under current forecast, that's going to add an additional $330 billion through the end of 2020 and will then increase consumers' cost $200 billion a year every year thereafter. The Fed's policies since 2008 have made inequality and gnawing economic insecurity much worse, which contributed to the social and political upheavals that have rocked the country over the last few years. After 10 years, this is just starting to improve. Uh, it is ju this is just starting to improve that for tens of millions of Americans who are beginning to recover lost jobs, homes, savings. This is no time to start taking tens and hundreds of billions of dollars out of the pockets of Main Street and making inequality much worse. If the Fed would not take away the punch bowl away from Wall Street and the wealthy, allowing them to recover virtually immediately after the crash, it shouldn't be taking away what little recovery Main Street is now experiencing. Thank you.